Africana Philosophy by T.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Religion and Pure Principles, Maria W. Stewart. If you ask people who the first feminist philosopher was, the name you're most likely to hear is Mary Wollstonecraft, thanks to her pioneering Vindication of the Rights of Woman, published in 1790. If you've been listening to the podcast episodes on Renaissance philosophy that have been appearing in parallel with this series on Africana philosophy, you'll know that there would be still earlier claimants for that title, like Christine de Pizan. Her book of the City of Ladies, The Defense of the Virtues of Womankind, was published almost four centuries earlier in 1405, and in her wake followed several female Renaissance humanists like Moderata Fonte and Lucrezia Marinelli who argued stridently for the moral and intellectual equality of women. From these humanists to Wollstonecraft, a constant refrain is the value of education for girls. Fonte wrote that if this were offered from a young age, we'd outstrip men's performance in any science or art you care to name. Hundreds of years later, Wollstonecraft was still making the same plea. Education is one of the main themes of her vindication. She recommends teaching the two sexes together outside the home in day schools, and emphasizes that this will, in due course, prepare women to be better wives, with husbands benefiting from having more equal, learned, and virtuous spouses. It makes sense that all these authors would put a high value on education, since they themselves had an unusually high level of schooling for women of their times, but this was not only a matter of the intelligentsia praising its own intelligence. Whether in the 15th, the 18th, or the 21st century, education is a crucial step towards equality, an obvious route of escape for oppressed social groups. Oppressors know this too, which is why in 19th century America, slaves were often violently prevented from obtaining even basic literacy. The point did not escape that trenchant critic of slavery, David Walker, whom we just met in the last episode. He observed that the American slave owner's greatest object and glory is centered in keeping us sunk in the most profound ignorance and stupidity. If they catch a colored person with a book in his hand, they will beat him nearly to death. If learning seemed a great and necessary goal to women authors and to African-American authors, then how much would it be valued by an author who was an African-American woman? Lots, as we can see from the life and writings of Maria W. Stewart, a great admirer of Walker, who followed him in lending her rhetorical skill to the cause of racial liberation and uplift. We know a good deal about her life story, thanks to autobiographical remarks in her own writings and surviving documents like her claim for a pension as the widow of a veteran of the War of 1812. Born Maria Miller in 1803 in Connecticut, she was orphaned as a child and grew up as an indentured servant. Even after being released from this status, she continued doing domestic work in order to support herself, but also began to seek education by attending Sabbath school classes. At some point, she moved to Boston, where she met the man she married, James W. Stewart. Somewhat unusually, and apparently at his request, she took not only his last name, but his middle initial as well, becoming Maria W. Stewart. It is impossible to know what sort of public profile, if any, Stewart would have achieved if she had been able to continue living as James's wife. What happened instead is that tragedy struck. James died in December of 1829. This tragic event was further compounded by race-based injustice, as white executors managed to cheat Stuart out of the inheritance left to her by her husband. In this way, Stuart lived through precisely what Walker described as the way things go in Boston when he wrote in his appeal, But I must really observe that in this very city, when a man of color dies, if he owned any real estate, it most generally falls into the hands of some white person. The wife and children of the deceased may weep and lament if they please, but the estate will be kept snug enough by its white possessor. Stewart and her husband would have known Walker as members of Boston's black community. In fact, when Walker and his wife Eliza moved out of their home at 81 Joy Street in 1829, the Stewarts moved in, and Maria continued to live there after James's death. So it was a further emotional blow to Maria when, while still dealing with her grief over the loss of her husband, Walker suddenly died in August of 1830. There has been controversy ever since concerning what caused Walker's death. There's relatively strong evidence that he died of tuberculosis, but at the time and ever since, many have suspected that he was poisoned, and thus have seen his death as a form of martyrdom in light of the audacious publication of his appeal. In the wake of these events, 
Stuart experienced a religious transformation, a sort of new conversion to the truth of Christianity, in spite of the fact that she had already had ties to the church before then. Along with this newfound piety came a burning desire to speak out for the cause of black freedom. Near the beginning of her first publication, a pamphlet entitled Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality, the sure foundation on which we must build, she announces, Many will suffer for pleading the cause of oppressed Africa, and I shall glory in being one of her martyrs. For I am firmly persuaded that the God in whom I trust is able to protect me from the rage and malice of my enemies, and from them that will rise up against me. And if there is no other way for me to escape, he is able to take me to himself, as he did the most noble, fearless, and undaunted David Walker. This passage exemplifies the way Stuart treats Walker as an icon of resistance, sometimes invoking him without even saying his name. In one speech, she asks, But where is the man that has distinguished himself in these modern days by acting wholly in the defense of African rights and liberty? There was one, although he sleeps, his memory lives. There can be no doubt that she means Walker, especially because she is echoing what she wrote in Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality, God hath raised you up a walker and a garrison. Though walker sleeps, yet he lives, and his name shall be held in everlasting remembrance. The garrison mentioned here is of course William Lloyd Garrison, the radical white abolitionist. He printed Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality for Stuart in 1831, and once she started giving path-breaking public speeches the following year, he advertised and printed them in his newspaper, The Liberator. Decades later, shortly before his death in 1879, Garrison wrote to Stuart recalling how impressed he had been when they'd first met, and adding, Your whole adult life has been devoted to the noble task of educating and elevating your people. He was not exaggerating. In the wake of the Civil War, she opened a Sunday school near the Freedmen's Hospital, where she served as matron. She too died in 1879, and her funeral was overseen by Alexander Crummel, who will be the focus of a future episode in the series. In a testimony attached to a collection of her writings, Crummel wrote somewhat patronizingly of his great surprise at the literary aspiration and ambitious authorship of Stuart, given that these were, he claims, traits otherwise seen almost exclusively among the men of the black community at the time he met her. Garrison, by contrast, allowed only that he had felt satisfaction, not necessarily surprise, on meeting Stuart, though he did print her pieces in the section of his paper called the Ladies' Department. When she devoted her later years to educating the black community, Stuart was quite literally practicing what she had preached back in the 1830s. In the public lectures that she gave in Boston, something unprecedented for an American woman of any color, a constant refrain is the need for her black audience to establish schools and seek knowledge. Through these means they may avoid wasting their talents which go unencouraged and unexploited by American society as a whole. She writes, Many bright and intelligent ones are in the midst of us, but because they are not calculated to display a classical education, they hide their talents behind a napkin. When arguing that deep learning is not foreign to the African soul, she sounds like she's listened closely to early episodes of our podcast series. History informs us that we sprung from one of the most learned nations of the whole earth, from the seat, if not the parent, of science. Yes, Poor despised Africa was once the resort of sages and legislators of other nations, was esteemed the school for learning, and the most illustrious men of Greece flocked thither for instruction. Stuart often addresses herself to women hearers, and speaking especially to the mothers among them, she recommends that they look to the educating of their children. Even if proper schools are inaccessible to them as blacks, they can at least have them taught in the first rudiments of useful knowledge and then hire private tutors for more advanced topics. And she stresses that this goes for girls as well as boys. How long, she asks, shall the fair daughters of Africa be compelled to bury their minds and talents beneath a load of iron pots and kettles? She then answers her own question, until union, knowledge, and love begin to flow among us. We have never had an opportunity of displaying our talents, therefore the world thinks we know nothing. She endorses the old adage that knowledge is power, and sees wisdom and understanding alongside trust in God as the tools to overcome the fears that grip the African-American population, inhibiting them from striving for greater things. As the talk of private tutors indicates, Stewart is not speaking primarily to slaves here, but to so-called free blacks, whose legal and financial condition gives them at least some measure of control over their own lives. 
she is unsparing in her criticism of the way that this modest opportunity for self-determination is often squandered. She certainly recognizes the oppression faced by free blacks, who are usually allowed only to work as servants so that their status is in fact little better than that of slaves, but more often, Stewart turns her oratorical fire on the black community itself. It is they who fail to invest in schools as they should. We ought to follow the example of the whites in this respect. Nothing would raise our respectability, add to our peace and happiness, and reflect so much honor upon us as to be ourselves the promoters of temperance and the supporters, as far as we are able, of useful and scientific knowledge. Given the stern and earnest tone of her writings, it's pretty easy to picture what Stuart herself must have been like as a teacher. You can bet no one was whispering at the back or passing notes in her class. This is a woman who, at an older age, pronounced herself horrified at the suggestion that a celebration of Christmas might include music and dancing. She was above all a moralist and a religious crusader, fired by an early religious experience and motivated in all her writing by a deep faith. She imagines critics complaining of the way she harps on religion as an abiding theme, but invokes divine guidance for the very fact that she is daring to make her ideas public. I believe that God has fired my soul with a holy zeal for his cause. It was God alone who inspired my heart to publish the meditations thereof. Stuart, like Wollstonecraft, also sees a close connection between education and virtue. Again, she emphasizes this connection especially for her female audience. O oh, woman, woman! Would thou only strive to excel in merit and virtue? Would thou only store thy mind with useful knowledge? Great would be thine influence. With what may look like undue optimism, she even predicts that, were the American free people of color to turn their attention more assiduously to moral worth and intellectual improvement, the result would be that prejudice would gradually diminish and the whites would be compelled to say, unloose those fetters. This is not to say that she sees the white population through rose-tinted spectacles. Again, she is all too aware of the limits that white racism places on blacks and their moral and intellectual development, but her default tone is one of moral exhortation, and even chastisement of her own community, a strategy she at one point explicitly defends. Let us no longer talk of prejudice till prejudice becomes extinct at home. Let us no longer talk of opposition till we cease to oppose our own. For while these evils exist, to talk is like giving breath to the air and labor to the wind. Here it's worth returning to the relationship between her position on how to achieve black liberation and that of her hero, David Walker. On most points that were being debated by black leaders of the time, Walker and Stewart were in full agreement. In particular, she wholeheartedly echoed his opposition to the idea that black Americans should settle in Africa, as proposed by the American Colonization Society. She dwelt on this topic in an address she gave at the African Masonic Hall in 1833, not long before leaving Boston. You might remember that Prince Hall, founder of the Masonic Lodge in this city, had at one point tried to raise funds for transportation of free blacks to Africa, but Stuart has nothing but disdain for the scheme of the ACS. Showing again her concern with education, she tartly remarks in her speech at the Masonic Hall, If the colonizers are the real friends to Africa, let them expend the money which they collect in erecting a college to educate her injured sons in this land of gospel light and liberty. Demonstrating how seriously she takes white racism, she depicts the colonization scheme as the latest step in a repetitive cycle in which non-white people are displaced in order to avoid treating them equally. In a single passage, she encapsulates a whole history of American injustice, writing, The unfriendly whites first drove the Native American from his much-loved home. Then they stole our fathers from their peaceful and quiet dwellings and brought them hither, and made bondmen and bondwomen of them and their little ones. They have obliged our brethren to labor, kept them in utter ignorance, nourished them in vice, and raised them in degradation. And now that we have enriched their soil and filled their coffers, they say that we are not capable of becoming like white men, and that we can never rise to respectability in this country. They would drive us to a strange land. Her repudiation of this cycle of displacement would not be at all out of place in Walker's writings. Before I go, she says, the bayonet shall pierce me through. Yet, despite her agreement with Walker on this and other issues, there appears to be at least one major difference. Without ever acknowledging disagreement with Walker, Stuart explicitly declines to encourage violent resistance, and at one point expresses a decided preference for moral and pedagogical exhortation, 
Far be it from me to recommend to you either to kill, burn, or destroy, but I would strongly recommend to you to improve your talents. Let not one lie buried in the earth. Show forth your powers of mind. One can easily imagine Walker responding with characteristic passion, far be it from me to discourage killing, burning, and destroying, when it may result in our freedom, and of course adding a string of exclamation points. Despite the broad agreement between the two thinkers, this difference over the issue of violent resistance seems to be a weighty one. But scholars are not of one mind about this matter. Christina Henderson has argued that Stewart does in fact advocate violent resistance, and in a particularly remarkable way. According to Henderson, by grounding violent resistance in an ethic of Christian sympathy and kindness, Stewart complicates the discourse of both movements, offering a unique model of love-inspired violence. Henderson points to a variety of sentiments in Stewart's speeches to defend this interpretation, but prominent among them are those that involve the embrace of martyrdom, something we've mentioned a number of times as well. Henderson cites, for example, this declaration from the second of Stewart's four speeches, I can but die for expressing my sentiments, and I am as willing to die by the sword as by the pestilence. But is this a matter of taking up swords, or simply being prepared to be cut down by one if it comes to that? At times, she seems ready to recommend violence only to pull back at the last moment. In Religion and the Pure Principles of Morality, for example, she uncharacteristically addresses white Americans and warns, We claim our rights. We will tell you that we are not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that, can do no more, but we will tell you whom we do fear. We fear him who is able, after he hath killed, to destroy both soul and body in hell forever. Meaning God, of course. If this were Walker, these remarks would be followed by a reflection on the necessary obligatory nature of violent resistance in certain circumstances. Stewart, though, goes on by returning to her African-American audience, Then, my brethren, sheathe your swords and calm your angry passions. Stand still and know that the Lord, he is God. Vengeance is his, and he will repay. Should we see this as a repudiation of Walker? Certainly not of his thought as a whole. Though Walker clearly emphasized violent resistance, he put just as much emphasis on the need for self-improvement through learning and ambition. Stewart takes up this dimension of Walker's thought and makes it her central theme. Have the sons of Africa no souls? She asks. Feel they no ambitious desires? Shall the chains of ignorance forever confine them? Where can we find among ourselves the man of science or a philosopher, or an able statesman or a counselor at law? Show me our fearless and brave, our noble and gallant ones. Where are our lecturers on natural history and our critics in useful knowledge? But if Stuart in this sense carries on Walker's legacy, she undoubtedly also adds a distinctive twist. She is unsurprisingly more interested than Walker in the specific predicament faced by black women. She sees them as forming a distinct group with its own challenges and responsibilities, and thus speaks of the need to achieve unity specifically among women, not only among African Americans more generally. Characteristically, her idea is that such unity could express itself in founding schools, as well as a common determination to live prudently and economically. She does not, however, call them to step forward and speak in public, as she is doing. She is keenly aware that religious crusading and political polemic is hardly something her contemporaries will expect from a woman. You may remember from episode 40 the resistance that Jarena Lee had to overcome to become a public preacher. Or if that's too far back, just think again of Crummel's admission of surprise when he was confronted with the brilliance and ambition of Maria Stewart herself. She tackles this issue head-on in her farewell address in Boston, the last of her public speeches in which she complains of the opposition that met her from within her own community. Stewart asks, what if I am a woman? and then justifies her political oratory with reference to female figures from the Bible as an authorizing precedent. Perhaps because she's expecting potential critics to cite it against her, she mentions St. Paul's infamous ban on women speaking in public, but she just as quickly dismisses the relevance of this for her own situation, assuring us that St. Paul himself would surely approve, did he but know of our wrongs and deprivations. She also takes inspiration from earlier women authors. Increasing our suspicion that Stuart was somehow listening to podcasts, despite living in the 19th century, she refers to those same female humanists we mentioned at the start of this episode and have been covering in the series on Renaissance philosophy. Since there were learned women already in the 15th century, she says, why cannot we become divines and scholars? But of course she didn't get this information from podcasts. She is instead drawing on a work called Sketches of the Fair Sex, written in 1790 by one John Adams, but not that John Adams. 
As with her allusion to the scientific heritage of Africa in ancient times, Stewart draws on historical research to buttress her case for the dignity of both black and white people, of both women and men. It is here that we should locate Stewart's most important and distinctive contribution to Africana thought in the first half of the 19th century. We've seen a number of male authors speaking eloquently and explicitly about racial equality, but we haven't seen those authors making a parallel case for equality between the sexes. Stewart does precisely that. She strikes a fairly familiar note by arguing that it is not the color of the skin that makes the man, but it is the principles formed within the soul. But it's less familiar when she argues that black women have just as much talent as anyone else. We've already seen her complaining of the servitude of the fair daughters of Africa, their talent squandered among the pots and kettles. And we've heard of her involvement with educational societies devised specifically for black women. And consider this remarkable passage addressed to white women on behalf of black women. Had we had the opportunity that you have had to improve our moral and mental faculties, what would have hindered our intellects from being as bright and our manners from being as dignified as yours? Had it been our lot to have been nursed in the lap of affluence and ease and to have basked beneath the smiles and sunshine of fortune, should we not have naturally supposed that we were never made to toil? Even if Mary Wollstonecraft had thought of extending her educational campaign to black women as well as white women, we doubt that she could have said it better herself. Stewart is not the last black woman thinker of the 19th century whose philosophical ideas we will be exploring in depth. Next time, though, we will look at a male author who, like her, emerged from Boston's black community in the 1820s and 30s. This was Hosea Easton, who knew Walker and presumably Stewart as well, but differed from them in his analysis of racial oppression and its effects. So join us for the next episode, which will as usual appear two weeks from now on Sunday morning, Easton, Standard Time, here on the History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God all